Hey folks, coming to you today from Southeastern Virginia from the Gardener's Workshop Farm. And um, my name is Lisa Mason Ziegler for those of you that don't haven't ever visited us here. And um, just really glad to be here broadcasting Lisa Live on Facebook Live. So, hey Kim. Um, so I'm just really happy and I'm telling you my notes are a mess today so I'm gonna have to be looking from here to there because um, I really have so much um, to tell you. Hey, so Kim, it's hot in Tennessee and dry. Well, we were blessed with rain last night. The last couple of days, we were bone dry. Um, in fact, I ordered a bunch of irrigation stuff to get my systems really in order and um, then we got, I think we've gotten an inch and a half in the last 48 hours, so that was really, really good. But I really have a lot to, hey Linda, have a lot to tell you guys today. So I've made a list and I'm gonna say them and then I'm gonna say them again probably midway or at the end of our Facebook Live here. First off, I am really liking coming to you later in the day, particularly today because it's cloudy. I hear a little rumbling in the background, but I don't think we're supposed to get, hey Tanya, um, I don't think we're supposed to get, according to the radar, any really nastiness right now. Um, but I like coming to you later in the day. It seems like there's a lot of people that we haven't had on before can get on. And I will tell you that next week's broadcast is um, at 7 p.m. Because I'm going to give you a walking tour of the farm as, and the light should be really good then, I think. So um, tune in for that. And, um, you know, if you aren't already on my list, please go, hey, Wanda in Alaska, um, please go to the gardenersworkshop.com, sign up, we'll send you some resources, and that will keep you in the know because we have so much going on this season, um, and it's changing all the time, as you're about to hear. And if you're already on my list, you may already know this, um, that we have the big announcement, well, one of the big announcements is that we are, in fact, having an open farm this year. We had said that we weren't gonna do one this year because I had a big project that was gonna be going on, but in fact, that project has been postponed. And I just looked at Suzanne last week and said, why don't we just do an, on far an open farm? So we're doing it. It is June 29th from nine to 2 p.m. And um, I, what I usually do is a ongoing tour we are really incorporating, hey, Monica from South Dakota and Kent Miles um, and Katie. So Katie must be coming. Can't wait to see your farm. Um, so what happens is from nine to two is I kind of do a, a kind of a constant walking, talking, demonstrating tour. And people, as they come in, can join it at any time. We'll actually have one of my local, um, one of our really good friends of the farm, Rhonda Graves, who is a local master gardener. She's gonna kind of man the native border that has become such a big thing around here. Um, and she's gonna be talking about that. And um, so it'll be a really, really fun day. And here's something else. I didn't wanna put anything on Facebook about this until this Facebook was done, but Suzanne and I are gonna be doing a surprise Facebook Live Monday morning at about 6 a.m. She's actually coming in and is gonna be real time of me harvesting flowers. So we'll do it from the get start right until the sun gets so bad that she can't hang with us. So please join us for that. And I'll post about that on Facebook as an event so you can be reminded. Um, but I've never done that. I mean, it's gonna be real, y'all. So we're gonna call it reality TV from the gardener's workshop. It may not be so hot, but anyway, we're gonna give it a try. So I think those are all the things that I wanted to talk to you about. And I know you guys, and I've written on paper this week, and I've written in a notebook that has really important stuff in it. So I can't rip the pages out. So they're now scattered in. So wait a minute, let me find page two, that's three. Oh, that's right, page two went the other way. Y'all, this is really crazy today. So, y'all are really good about this. Um, hey, Cheesecake Farm. Wished I had a cheesecake right about now, Carla, um, especially one of yours. So, y'all are always really good about doing this. 
please like and share this broadcast, particularly if you're a member of a closed group. If it's people that you think might benefit from here in our Facebook Lives, invite your friends um, and share this. So that really, really helps me a whole lot. So today I am kind of um, telling my journey. You know, for those of you that have read my books, Cool Flowers and Vegetables Love Flowers, either one of them, I tell a little bit about my garden and love story, you know, how, you know, I met this guy and he came with a great garden and the right equipment and, you know, it was just meant to be for me to walk through the door of becoming a flower farmer. Well, as there always is in stories, there's a whole lot more to that than that. But what I wanted to um, kind of pick up and talk about is after I first started farming, how that all, hey, Judy from Illinois, more rain coming. Oh, hey, Joni in Ohio. Um, so I wanted to kind of talk about, you know, once Steve and I were married and I started flower farming while I was still working my full-time job and then was just able basically over about a two-year period, um, I was in a position that I could quit my full-time job and that's what I did. And so back then, to kind of give you the backstory to that, so back then this whole property was only an acre and a quarter. Actually, it was 1.17 acres. It was um, not really, really big. And there was two existing big gardens. They were about a quarter acre each. Steve's family had been, um, and Steve had been gardening there for many years, big, big vegetable gardens. And so when I was able to quit my job, I like went at it, right? Um, you know, I, I, he came with the equipment, right? He came with the dump trucks and Troy built tiller and, um, it was just a given for me to do this. So, y'all, I went at it. I was producing from these two quarter acre gardens. Back then, I did one, I did the Williamsburg Farmers Market each Saturday, which is a really big, successful market here. I was the first, um, I was the flower vendor when it first started. And up until that farmer's market, I had been strictly a wholesale um, seller because I'll tell you this, you know, rabbit hole already, what we've only been on for like, what, three minutes and I've already gone down a rabbit hole. When I first started flower farming, I had read every book, right? Once I had finally figured out seed starting, which held me back for two years, I was a crummy seed starter. Then I learned the way that I do it now and I became an overnight success, small space, no greenhouses. Well, then my next dilemma was, I was a horrible like flower arranger. You know, I would, get flowers and try to make bouquets and they just all, hey, Sophie in Quebec, um, I would try to make bouquets and they just looked horrible, you know? I mean, they really were bad. And so then I went on this tangent of figuring out ways I could sell flowers and never have to make a bouquet. So where that landed me was going in the back door of florist shops. And the first florist that I pursued based on what I read in Lynn's book, The Flower Farmer. I cased the joint, hey Drew and Pamela. Um, I cased the most upscale florist around town that I could find. And I now have a big black bumblebee circling me also. If I swat him, you'll know what I'm doing. Um, so I did exactly what her book told me, cased out the most upscale high volume florist. Um, I shot, I went in there all winter long. By the way, do you know how um, garden centers aren't just garden centers? Hey, Greg from Georgia, Greg Keys, we have Haas tools on here. Um, hey, Kim. Um, so I, I was just, this may surprise some of you all. We'll just have a confession right now too. I have a very low self-esteem very often. And I was so terrified to take my flowers to somebody to sell them. I thought, why would they want my crummy garden flowers, right? So all winter, I went down to that garden center, which what I was going to say is, you know, garden centers now aren't just garden centers. They have a gift area and they have a flower shop. Well, that worked out great for me because I went down there all winter, the non-shopper, and would get a cart and go all over that store, um, scoping out the flower shop and just really watching them and seeing who was in charge and how many flowers did they really get in this place and just, I mean, I stalked them is what we would call that today, right? Um, so 
you know, and the story goes that I was, so all winter I did that. I, my first planted garden commercially was a cool flowers garden. I launched my business on hardy annuals, not very many, like five, I think. Um, and so I had these flowers come May and every morning Stevie would say to me, are you taking your flowers down today? And I'd say, no, I'd have an excuse. I'd have a reason I could, hey, Daniel and Chris, I'd have a reason that I couldn't go down there. And finally, one day, he just shared words of wisdom with me by saying, take your flowers down there. And if they don't buy them, we'll just never shop there again. And believe it or not, that gave me the confidence to just put my little buckets for free samples in the back seat. I was driving an Aurora back then, an Oldsmobile. No, maybe it wasn't. Anyway, I drove a four-door sedan. I didn't even have a truck. Put my flowers in, went down there, swept the guy off his feet. And because of how wonderfully he embraced me, and I have read this same story for so many flower farmers. Anyway, he helped me get started and I moved on. Well, he bought everything that I grew for the first year. Then he introduced me to other florists as I started growing more. And then as I became, I mean, in my second year, I had people knocking down my door for flowers. What does that do to you? Let me tell you what it does to you. It makes you go crazy and grow way more. I'm sorry, now we have lots of sirens going on. Um, and, um, when everybody, when you can't grow enough, it makes you work harder and harder and harder. And so basically I was a huge success. Um, and I'm still kind of that way here where I am because I am an urban farm in the middle of the city of Newport News. I'm sure everybody has um, watched about the beach, Virginia Beach. I'm about, we sold flowers all over Virginia Beach. I'm about um, 40 minutes from them. We sold from Virginia Beach up to Williamsburg, and oh my goodness, I was a one-man show back then, shouldn't I say that too? Um, so I was doing everything, selling just a florist, and until I joined that first farmer's market two years later. And when you don't have enough product, it tends to make you plant more and do more, and um, so I did all those things, and I was, then I joined the Williamsburg Farmer's Market, so I was literally probably working six days a week. We don't work on Sunday. Working six days a week, sun up to sundown. I mean, I was really crazy. And fortunately, I'm married to a guy that also is owns a business. So, you know, he helped me out a lot and oftentimes cooked dinner and did a lot of things. Um, and we just made it work. Well, after about five years of being very successful, and you all can't believe how many flowers, I would produce five to 6,000 flowers a week from those two quarter acre gardens by myself. But I was crazy. I mean, it was bad, and I have no children. Um, so what that led to was crashing and burning, right? Has anybody else ever crashed and burned on any job? I mean, farming can do it to you really fast. Um, so I am um, crashed and burned. And so you know how it is. It's August, you're thinking to yourself, oh my gosh, I'm not sure I can live through the next two months. You know, you are so tuckered out. You know, fall is a big season. Um, you're trying to get stuff planted. You know, oh my goodness, it's just a crazy, crazy time. And then I started entertaining this thought in my mind. Um, and at this point in time, I was already given programs to garden clubs. That happened probably my first gig maybe not my first, my first was very early on in my career, but I really started getting into the garden club groups probably by my second year. And what would happen is I would go and talk to these, I probably went maybe within the corner of our state. Um, and now I have a fly bothering me. So if I kill a fly on screen, um, sorry. Um, I started doing these garden clubs and two things became really, really apparent to me. First off, Teaching was clearly a very strong gift that I have in empowering other people. Um, I tend to simplify things, make things just um, 
clear the fog, get down to the black and white, just give me the darn instructions and tell me to go, right? And that's how I tend to teach. And so I really kind of became a successful speaker right from the get-go. And what would happen when I would go and talk to these garden clubs and master gardeners, I even spoke to rotary clubs, I spoke to all different kinds of organizations and I would only do it back then, like November through February when I wasn't farming. I would go speak, do a little program, and I would give, after the first few programs, I realized that I had to start giving out resource lists. People wanted to know, well, where can we get, you know, I had a slideshow, a beautiful slideshow, you know, it was big honking zinnias and I mean, all the same stuff we grow now, right? And they say, where can we get those zinnia seeds? That was the number one question I've ever been asked. Where can I get the zinnia seeds? So I had this long list of where people could buy supplies. What was the other most interesting thing um, that I taught about or people were interested in, which kind of helped me carve out what I talk about today, is people struggle with seed starting, right? I couldn't believe it. Commercial growers, master gardeners, um, gardeners, I mean, garden club people, horticulturists, you name it. You mentioned seed starting, all the hands go up. So I would give them resource lists where they could buy soil blockers, how they could find grow lights. I mean, I gave them a list probably of 30, 40 different places to go for all the different things I was mentioning to them. So, you know, you add up all of that in your mind during the winter while you're given programs, it's no longer hot. You don't have buckets to wash, gardens to weed, plants to plant, you're, you're hearing me, right? And all of a sudden, a dream was born in my brain. This would have been, um, I started farming in 1998, and, um, I, oh, berries coming out. I started farming in 1998, in 2004, in the winter, is when the Gardener's Workshop was born. Prior to that, I had always been Ziegler Garden. I mean, I just named, I mean, my husband owned Ziegler Plumbing. I thought Ziegler Garden was a perfect name. Um, but as this new business was being born in my mind, um, doing these programs and these people eager to buy this stuff and where to find it. The gar what is now, what became the gardener's workshop initially um, was born. And y'all, it was crazy. I told my sister about it um, probably in January. She was on board. We went to work like two crazy women. So the gardener's workshop was launched April of 2005. And when it was launched, it was launched as a direct sales company. And you all know what that is, whether you know it or not, it's like Pampered Chef. Because in my mind, that's basically what I was doing, doing programs, right? I was teaching people how to garden and they wanted to buy my stuff. So my brainchild was, what better model to, to to have people that love gardening like I do, there's so many, so many people that are so qualified to do this, and give them a way to create income for themselves, right? So, we launched the Gardener's Workshop out of total naivety, if that's a word, as a direct sales company. We launched it, I think it was April 15th, actually, that year. We did a huge seminar here locally. And uh, my friend Amy from Amy's Garden, she and I um, gave a, a full day program at this local, um, the Yoder Barn, which is a big theater. Um, and we sold out, it was a packed house. And I thought, well, we will take some of the products that we're gonna be selling. I mean, we had soil blockers, we had a whole bunch of other stuff. We'll just take it to highlight you know, that we're gonna be selling this stuff and people can come on and become a sales rep. We called our sales reps garden stewards. So, oh my gosh, and I had two friends from church kind of be there on hand to kind of stay downstairs where the stuff is and give out our literature and tell people about it. Y'all, 
as soon as we broke for a snack at like 10.30 and people went downstairs, it was like a mob scene. People wanted to buy the stuff. And we were set up to sell. We thought, well, maybe somebody will want to buy a pack of seeds or something. Oh my goodness. It was crazy. It was so crazy. So there was probably about 85 or 90 people there. And the room that the stuff was in was kind of small. We didn't bring a whole lot of stock. We just brought like samples. I, on the break, had to jump in my van and go to our warehouse and get stuff and bring it back. The story of that day was people, as we went back in to give the seminar, people were sneaking out of the seminar to go downstairs and buy stuff. At the end of the day, I mean, we sold everything we had just about. Well, that was the launch of the Gardener's Workshop, and we were off to a great start, so I thought. And anybody that's ever started a business, things don't always go like you think they are. So we went about booking in-home workshops, my sister, Suz um, Suzanne, and then people started coming on as garden stewards or sales reps, right? And let me tell you, it was really tough going because just like for when you start a business, you think people, you got a great product, you think people are gonna knock your doors down like they did that day in the barn, well, it didn't happen. And Susan Ackerman, I see, is on here. Susan was the very first garden steward. We have Susan, I'm telling the story of the gardener's workshop back when we were a direct sales company. I'm at that part of my journey. And um, so Susan was one of the first to come on, and Suzanne and I worked ourselves. And as people, sales reps started coming on, um, we grew. And Suzanne and I joined the Direct Gardening Association, um, which is like the commercial professional trade um, organization for those types of company. We went to a seminar, and or we went to a conference, and we were sitting around the round table with the CEO of um, Pampered Chef, um, Herbalife, all these other big companies. And this was probably about a year into business. And let me tell you, I had already started to feel like I had made a huge mistake because as we were getting busy, what did I start doing less and less of? Farming. I was basically, I became a gardener. So we go to this conference because, you know, we knew nothing about this industry, right? Just like me. I mean, I'm diving into things I know nothing about, right? I go to this conference, which was the most expensive conference I have ever been to in my life. And as I'm listening to these people talk, I'm realizing I have really made, learning how the structure of those types of businesses work, I was, it was becoming clearly clear to me that I had made a huge mistake, but I had made a huge personal financial investment um, a lot of people had, well, not financial, but a lot of people had their hands in. So I thought, to darn it, I've made my bed. I'm going to lie in it, right? So came back and we implemented. I actually I hired a, um, one of the business consultants from there to help us. We started getting um, sales reps on board or garden stewards, as we called them. Um, and we it started to work. I mean, you can't imagine the systems that you have to have, all I became was the person patting people on the back saying, good job, sell more, sell more. I became a sales leader is what I became. I was not very happy at all. Um, and so we started building up our sales force. We had sales reps in nine states. You know, the ball starting to roll and I was miserable. I mean, I was not happy. I wasn't very, um, I'm not quite as bubbly as I am today back then um, because I just hated my job. I sat at a desk all day, pushed paper, um, really kind of supported other people. And I want to tell you one thing that became really apparent early on. Do you want to know why most people, um, especially people beyond our state, wanted to join with us? They wanted to learn how to garden from me. They didn't really want to have a business that they grew. So I was really miserable. We were producing all kinds of printed paperwork. I have a whole file cabinet of all the stuff that we printed back then, beautiful catalogs and anyway. Um, 
So we were coming along, Suzanne was losing her mind, filling these orders for these home parties or home workshops. I was still doing them and it became really apparent to me that I was the rainmaker. I was the number one sales rep. One thing I learned at that direct sales um, co um, conference that we went to, that less, that like 2% of the sales force of those huge companies do all the sales. That's why you have to have 20,000 sales reps, right? And I couldn't believe, I mean, I was just so discouraged after I learned the depressing truth about those businesses. You have to remember, I was a farmer when I went into this, right? So we started, so I thought, okay, we're doing this. We started building up, building up. Suzanne was overseeing the warehouse, filling all the orders. I mean, you can't imagine the orders that we would send. I would go to a garden club, big garden club, and do a program and we would sell our stuff, at, and we would sell from a catalog. We didn't take stock with us like a pop-up shop like we used to do later in life. We would sell so much stuff um, that the rewards that these groups would get based on the, the dollar amount that we would sell them was phenomenal. And so we were kind of finding our way and figuring out how to do it, and then I got cancer. I know a lot of you probably never knew that um, about me. It was 11 years ago and I got breast cancer, and it was really tough. It was really, was really tough on our family because A, I had cancer, right? But I was the first person, I was 46 years old, no one in my family, you can hear Carolyn's back, that's our little singing bird behind me here. Um, 46 years old, um, nobody in my family had ever had cancer, much less breast cancer. And because I'm one of these ladies that has fibrous tissue, my doctor started when I was 35 years old doing annual mammograms on me. And I just went in for my annual and thank goodness I had an alert radiologist because I, I had an early morning appointment um, because you know, I mean, I was working my can off. You think you work as a flower farmer? Do this. Hi, Donna. And um, he, they took my mammogram, made me wait, 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 wait. Then they come back in and said, we want to do something else. And then he called me in and showed me, he had my last seven years mammograms and showed me that, I mean, the speck, oh, it just started to rain, I think. Stevie, your door's open, honey, and it's starting to rain. Um, anyway, it was very, very small. And you could look back seven years and see it coming along. And um, so, that started a little bit of a problem. Um, so because of being in business and you don't want people to feel like, when you tell people, if you're a business person and people find out you're sick or something, the first inclination in your mind anyway is that people say, oh, I don't wanna bother her. I'll call somebody else. Um, so it's not that we kept it secret. Um, you know, my close friends and family and our people at friends at church and in our, immediate community knew about it, but we did not talk about it. And I mean, I had surgery and um, was moving along and I had to have radiation and it was laying on the couch in the last weeks of radiation um, that it just really, um, wait a minute, I gotta move to my pages here. I'm losing track of what I'm, um, I made the decision, what the heck am I doing? You know, here I was farming and loving life. I got burnt out by doing too much. Had this great brainstorm about starting this retail business. And, but I, I started it in the wrong format. Um, and I can remember, I mean, I was, I just felt like so many people were dependent on me that I didn't want to, end it. But laying on that couch, when I felt like I couldn't even lift my foot off the ground to take a step, I thought, what the heck am I doing? You know, life is short and I don't have to work for a living. So why am I doing something I'm miserable at? So I called up my sister and she burst into tears and said, thank heavens. <laughs> she was feeling the same way I was. And so I basically 
I then got some energy, y'all. I sat down and I wrote a Dear John letter to all the sales reps. I gave them six months. And so funny how that all went. That's a story in itself, too, but I won't drag you through that mud. Um, wrote them a letter and said, you have six months to make the most out of your deal. And um, the Gardener's Workshop is going to become a company of a sales force of one, me. And um, so Suzanne and I powwowed and we decided that my business would just become an online store. We'd print a catalog and I would do programs and we would figure out how to sell stuff through that venue as well as get a website. And, um, you know, the happy part is that allowed me to really start farming again. And you can ask my sister, I became a happy girl. We love the business model that we have now. Um, I mean, it really is so amazing. And we're constantly, I feel like I'm changing directions all the time, but you know what? That's what it takes to keep the ball rolling. Um, and so that's kind of all I'm gonna tell you about today. There, the, the next part I'll tell you, and I'll probably do that in a couple of weeks. We'll call that part two, ramping up the farming business. So after we made that transition that took about a year to kind of get our peas in a row, then I went back to farming and about two years after that is when um, we really ramped up. I mean, we were able to buy an acre and a half next door. That allowed me to produce a whole lot more flowers, which meant I could employ more of my family and a couple of friends. I had six employees for several years. We went the pedal to the metal. And um, I've been, a, I've been a cancer free for 11 years, hoping that holds out. And, um, and we've been farming ever since. So I'll tell the rest of my story later about how we just um, really made the most of what we're doing here in what I call my little utopia here in the middle of the city farming and I really feel like now today where Suzanne and I are headed and what we're doing is really where we want to be and um, we have some super exciting things coming on um, and I want to just say again some of those things I said at the beginning because I see we have people that have joined us you know please like and share um, this broadcast liking it and sharing it really help me on Facebook and when you share it that puts it on to your um, feed permanently all of my Lisa live feeds are always on my blog it takes them about a week to get on there so you can always go back um, and check that out so like and share I'm just reading my notes again y'all um, and remember the open open farm is June, June 29th, and on every email we send out, that's going to be on the bottom, sometimes at the top, because we have been telling people for one year, for since the last one, last June, that we are, hey, Susan from Arkansas, um, we have been telling people that we're not going to do an open farm, and I'm telling you y'all, last year, we have a guest book, last year we had people that drove from um, Louisiana, Texas, South Carolina, Georgia, upstate New York, Pennsylvania. I mean, it floored us. It floored us. So we don't want anybody to miss it. So June 29th is the open farm. And then remember, Suzanne and I are going to be doing a sleepy Facebook Live um, Sunday. I mean, Monday morning. Uh, she's supposed to be here at 6 a.m. And it'll take me a minute to get our technical stuff worked out. And I mean, you're gonna, I mean, from me filling the buckets and doing my little how I run around to different spots and do things. And so we'll just be talking along. So please remember the gardenersworkshop.com. Sign up for my, um, to get on my email list so you can stay in the know because I will tell y'all something else. I am cooking up such an amazing thing, um, another project, but 
the word's not officially confirmed yet, so I can't share it. And if you um, are a flower farmer or a flower farmer wannabe, you are gonna die when I tell you what it is. It is so awesome. It is so over the moon. Um, we're thrilled about it here. I'm afraid to talk about it before it's confirmed because I don't want to bring up to make anything bad happen. So part two next Saturday, Facebook Live is at 7 p.m. Y'all get your, you know, have your dinner and um, get a little refreshment and we're just going to walk around the yard. The light should be good then. We'll look at the hydrangea patch, the native border, I'm hoping, um, and just our corn is amazing, our squash is amazing, and the zinnias are over the top. And actually, um, this, the Monday morning um, Facebook Live, you'll see the flower garden up close and personal. Um, so, and I also wanna, um, so, you know, I get all, so much stuff in my email box and on social media. I just finished my article today for the Cut Flower Association Quarterly, and this month, or this quarter, I wrote about cool flowers about the fact that if you live in the north and you think you can't fall plant and there are so many people that are really kind of bashing cool flowers because they live in like zone four or three and they they missed a really important part of the book and that's about very early spring blooming i mean planting um and anyway um I forgot what I was even getting at, y'all. Um, kind of, oh, one of the other things that, while I was reviewing social media in my inbox to find out what are people asking me about, the number one question, questions that I get is always about seed starting. And I also get the question, people aren't aware that we have an online course for seed starting. It's 20 bucks, y'all. It's like 80 or 90 minutes long, and if it teaches you how to start seeds out in the garden and how to soil block, and it's the best 20 bucks you'll ever send, spend. And if you don't know how um, online courses work, let me just take a minute to tell you, it is just like buying a book. But instead of picking up a book to read it, you pick up your device and log into your library. And right there are all your online courses that you purchase from me you can watch it as many times as you want um, for an unlimited number of times so i just want everybody to know that they're on there and um, sign up for our newsletter thegardenersworkshop.com and we will keep you in the know for all those things um, so I'm just going to read and see if there's any thanks you for sharing your story. All the best for your new venture and look forward to learning more. Yeah, Kim, it's not really a new venture. It's just a new project. And it is very, very exciting. Um, so Judy, I just got a delicate squash anxious to grow and taste. Man, I wished I'd have brought... I do want to show you this. This is going to be my little bathroom bouquet. Is this not the sweetest thing ever? This was the bouquet Suzanne had sitting... Um, right inside the door when our members only market people come here on Friday um, This was sitting right inside the door and I thought what a, and if y'all could smell it. It's got mint Just mint no lemon basil um, But is that's my yellow and purple together are just so very very sweet and I have a boatload of squash um, We're picking it really small this year You want to know what other rage? I don't know if Greg's still on here what we're doing is we are eating cucumbers when they're about as big as your thumb. Putting them in salad and eating them fresh. It is so delicious, y'all. Just regular cucumbers. You're just eating them as babies. Carolyn, oh, we, when will we know more? I am hoping the minute I get the confirmation, you can be sure I'll be blabbing about it on social media. I may actually be doing a special Facebook Live about that with the person. Let's see if there's any open farm cool. Please post info. Judy, go to thegardenersworkshop.com. On the home page, one of the blocks at the bottom says open farm. It has all the information there. Address, times, everything. Less is more, Marilyn. Let me tell you, not only is less more, less is more profitable if you're a business person. Pamela's coming to the open farm. I can't wait to see you. 
Susan, I'm feeling pretty sure from Arkansas, you're not coming. Carolyn, thank you so much for sharing your personal story. You are an inspiration to me. Thank you. I have been inspired by so many people. Um, you know, I mean, I work with my family, and that inspires me in itself. Um, because it's just so great to work with Suzanne and Kelly, my team. Then my behind-the-scenes team, Bobo, and then Susan that was on here is my personal editor. My sister-in-law, Sarah, um, does work for us, too. And it's just kind of like, I won't say it's a happy family every day. I mean, we all, of course, there are days that some of us aren't making eye contact. That is the truth. But you know what? We just get over it and move on, right? Sometimes less is actually more. Yes, Kim, you're so right. Judy, so sorry. You're amazing. Such a strong woman. You're blessed, and thanks for what you do. Hey, thanks. Thank you all for joining me here and um, having a look. So, oh, it's what's this? Garden clubs. Good idea. Love the ladies coming in wearing hats and discussing plants. Well, let me tell you, the garden clubs, I spoke to some of those too. There are so many layers of garden clubs. Um, from people that are gardeners, for people that um, are philanthropy, so philanthropic, I can't even say the word, that do a lot of philanthropy work, you know, and their garden clubs, they raise lots of money to benefit historical properties like Garden Club of Virginia, then there's Garden Club of America, then there's the Federated Garden Club of Virginia, and there's those for almost every state, and they all, are interested in programs. Crash and burn, been there and done that. Yep, flower power, hey. Hey, Washington. Getting out of the 90 degree weather, listening to you talk about flowers doesn't get any better than that. Hey, I agree with you, Triple B Farm. So, you know, I'm finishing with seasonal work at the green, thinking about being an independent gardener for others. Could use your opinion at your convenience. Well, Judy, turning what you love into a business kind of makes you at times not love what you do anymore. So if you need to make some bacon to put on the table, uh, I would probably work for somebody else first in that line of area, see what it's like, and then figure out what to do. I would definitely... Um, not go to work doing work for individual people if you have not worked for someone that you did that for because it is far more work and involved than you ever dreamed about. So I'm just reading here. Hey, Charlotte from Central Virginia. New Zealand. Hey, Deb. Savannah, Georgia. And then there's Pocosa in Virginia. I've got some locals too. Thank you, Kim. So, you know, I'm sure that everybody that watches the news knows that we had a terrible, terrible, terrible tragedy in Virginia Beach. Still just too hard to believe. Um, you know, everybody thinks to themselves, you know, that subcontractor that was killed getting a permit could have been my husband, you know, in a place like that. And you just realize how vulnerable we are. How vulnerable we are. We're so thankful for law enforcement. We're so thankful for first responders. We're so thankful for those that are serving in all those ways. Um, and we're just remembering all those people and, and families in our prayers and um, ask that you guys do it too. And um, I still, I don't want to know. They're only saying the suspect's name. They're calling in the suspect. They're refusing to give any acknowledgement, I guess, to him. And you know, we need to pray for his family, too. So, anyway, y'all, till we meet again, and I'm hoping I'll see. So, get up with your coffee at 6 a.m. Um, and join us for winging around this farm. Um, the weather should be really good. And, and check, be with me on my harvest on Monday morning. So, hey, thegardenersworkshop.com. Sign up for my news so you don't miss our big announcement or the special Facebook Live that'll probably happen when that is going to be made. Till we meet again, ciao!